Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Father David Carucci, and as Deacon Paul said, I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of Mobile and the pastor of Our Lady of the Gulf. Last night, back in the sacristy, uh, I was talking with Father Finney, and, and we do what priests do. You know, we, we try to figure out who the other person is by asking pointed questions. And, you know, how long have you been ordained, Father? Uh, about 27 years. He said, wow, I, yeah, that's I, oh, longer than I thought. And, you know, we talked, and he said, um, how long was it before you became a pastor, he, he asked me. I said, 11 months. And he looked at me and said, you're joking, because that's not normal. And so I had to go in and tell him. I said, well, I made, I made the classic rookie mistake. I asked for something. I volunteered. Never volunteer. That's, you know, I wasn't listening when they told us that. Uh, but I volunteered to go back and teach at school because there were three priests at the parish I was at. And so when I got my letter of appointment, I opened it up and it said, Congratulations, Father, you are the pastor of St. John the Baptist on Union Street, and you're appointed to the faculty of Montgomery Catholic High School. And I went, huh, that's not the way I remember the conversation. But, you know, there's a, there's a rule in the church, and I think in society in general, it's, it's called the Peter Principle, where you, you keep rising in an organization until you reach a point where you're incompetent to do the job that you're doing, and then they leave you there. Uh, it kind of works like that. Um, I, I don't know if I've reached that point yet. I, I'm working on becoming incompetent, but I, I, I don't think I'm quite there yet. Uh, all that is by way of saying... The only reason I'm here today is not because of any merit of mine, but because of who I know, Deacon Paul. Again, another classic way that church organization works. But I'm here today to talk about the Blessed Sacrament. And especially today on the Feast of the Trinity, to talk about the relationship between the Trinity and the Blessed Sacrament, and of course, our lives. Because if it's not related to our lives, it's not very meaningful. And I think it's an appropriate time because, as Deacon mentioned before Mass, the bishop is going to be doing a Eucharistic procession from the cathedral to here next weekend on the Feast of Corpus Christi. So maybe y'all can look good. You know y'all? Is that a word you're familiar with? I don't know that you use y'all up here. It's, it's, it's not as simple as you think, because y'all is the general plural. But we have more than that. We have also both y'all. What, what do you call that stuff we're having today? Booyah? booyah? Are both y'all coming over for booyah? Are, are all y'all coming over for Booyah? See, there's, there's different, it's, it's more complicated than it seems. But um, anyway, so y'all, all y'all, hopefully all y'all, can make an impression on the bishop that you actually know something about the Eucharist next weekend. But anyway, we're starting with the Trinity. And the Trinity is of its, in its core, it's a mystery. It's something we can't perceive by our mere human reason. We can deduce that there's a God by looking at creation, by using our own reason, but we're never going to say he's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, the only reason we can say that is through the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Trinity is ultimately a mystery. We can't wrap our head around what it means that God is one and three and totally understand it. You know, I remember when we were in seminary, our professor was getting very frustrated one day trying to explain something to us. And he finally said, well, well, it's just a mystery. And one of the seminarians slammed his hands on the desk and said, Ah, the mystery, the last bastion of confused theologians. I apologize to Father after class. 
But while we can't fully understand the Trinity, there are things I think that we can be certain about. There are truths that are meaningful and comprehensible to us. And at least in my reckoning, the first among them is that God is, in his very essence, a community of persons. He's not the Platonic God who is totally other and isolated. Not, that's, that's even the God of the Old Testament in a way. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is Lord alone. Yes, we profess one God, but we profess one God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. In his essence, he is a community of persons. And if we are created in the image and after the likeness of God, then you and I are called to live as a community of persons. It is essential to who we are as human beings, as men and women. We cannot live outside of an effective community, or at least we can't live well outside an effective community. And I think if we look around, we see the kind of damage that disrupting those traditional communities has in our society. Just a couple of weeks ago, I preached after the Uvalde shooting about the, the damage done to the very fundamental communities in which we live and the danger of that. And those fundamental communities, as I reckon them, are, are three, I could probably raise that to five, but three is enough for today. They are the family, and we've certainly seen the destruction wreaked upon the family in the last 50, 60, 70 years, and it's only accelerating. And the family is the base of human civilization and society. So when you mess with the family, you mess with the fundamentals. Another community that is at risk is our basic local community, whether that be our parishes and churches or whether that be our, our local neighborhoods and, and civil societies. You know, um, we're very appreciative of air conditioning in the South. We love it. Deacon told me it's the heat index in Gulf Shores was 102 yesterday. I believe it. But air conditioning changed the way we live our lives. No longer did we live on the front porch talking to our neighbors, trying to stay cool until you could go back inside. Now we live inside watching the idiot box not talking to our neighbors, right? Um, not too many years ago, there were 800 kids across the street. And St. Mary of the Angels was the center of everything that happened in this part of Green Bay because everything revolved around the parish. Every Karuchi wedding of a generation ahead of mine in their wedding photos, there's the bottom half of a bingo board because all the pictures were taken in the Knights of Columbus Hall, which is where everything happened because that's who they were. There were no destination weddings in those days. And, and the final set of relationships that's kind of broken down is the, 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 the friendships. Friendships aren't what they used to be. And I think social media is largely responsible for that. Because we don't talk to one another. You know, you get friends now by 
looking at other people's friends on, friend, on Facebook and giving them a friend request. That's not a relationship of friendship, at least not a meaningful one. And we don't talk to people anymore, we text. Now don't get me wrong, I like texting. When I drive back from my mother's house, I say, safe home, send. And it saves me 20 minutes. I appreciate it. But I, I feel, you know, I do feel like I have somehow not been a good son at that moment. Um, and this social media has so insist insidiously inserted itself into our lives that it's made us not be able to be friends with people who disagree with us on any number of issues. Oh, you're one of those? It's polarized us. Not to mention anything of what it's done to the relationship between men and women because of pornography. It has decimated expectations of what it means to be a man or what it means to be a woman. And because of that, our society is literally going crazy. If you look at this kid from Uvalde or any of the other number of mass shooters that we've had, you see a lot of common elements. A broken family, no connection to a community, uh, kind of an outcast without any real friends. That's what happens when we don't live out our existence as God created us to be. Members of community of persons. And that those members of the Trinity are active every time we come to Mass. You know, we begin Mass in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We leave Mass with the blessing of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then three times during Mass, explicitly, we say, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Except, interesting, listen next weekend, you're not going to say that because next weekend the prayer is not going to be directed to the Father. It's going to be directed to the Son. It's a really interesting change. And whenever anything changes in the liturgy, we ought to listen because it, it's there for a reason. But um, so it is principally God who is at work here in the liturgy. Yes, Father stands up here and says some words but he's not acting out of any virtue that David Carucci has or that Monsignor has. He's acting in the person and in the name of Christ. And it is Christ who makes himself present in this Eucharist. It is the Holy Spirit who comes upon these gifts that they may become for us the body and blood of Christ. And then it is Christ himself who is offered to the Father. And yet you and I play a very important role here today. Because, you know, um, talking with Father Finley in, in the interrogation, the priestly interrogation before Mass where we kind of feel each other out. He said, I've said Mass, or serve Mass under five different missiles, you know, going back uh, way before Vatican II. And um, I, I was saying, you know, one of the changes I liked that came about 13 or 14 years ago was we no longer say pray that our sacrifice. Now it's pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours that we each have a sacrifice to offer. All of our sacrifice as baptized people, which is our, uh, our lives as an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. And then the sacrifice of, of Christ, 
which is the, the, the priestly action here where the priest acts in persona Christi. But it's, it's that offering of our own lives that allows us to enter in to this liturgical action. And it allows us to be conformed to Christ and to enter into the life of the Trinity. So that when we leave Mass today, we leave as changed people. Because if all that's changed is the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, and we don't change, and we're wasting our time here. You know, the Second Vatican Council calls for the full, conscious, active participation of everybody at Mass. Full, conscious, active participation. Those three adjectives. And, you know, during the second, right after the Second Vatican Council, in many places, the way to have that full, conscious, active participation was to do ministries, to be an altar server, to be a lector, to be a choir member, to be a Deacon Paul and our favorite, the ushers. We love the ushers. It's because they take up the collection. <laughs> you know, that that was the way we express our ministry. Our, our, our full participation is through our ministry. But you know what? That as important as those ministries are, especially the ushers, um, all of us, each of us, are called to full active conscious participation. And I want to kind of wrap up what I'm doing here with, with something I, I, I hope is fun. Um, it, it, it may be a little uh, convicting, and if it is, I don't apologize. But I, I want to tell you what Deacon Paul and I and Monsignor and every communion minister, ordinary or extraordinary, sees on any given Sunday. And what we see are not people presenting themselves to Holy Communion who are doing so fully, consciously, and actively. They're just there because it's their turn. The lady next to them got up. They've done it with no reflection, or at least, so I'm not being judgmental, at least no appearance of reflection. You know, uh, St. Paul does give us a, a pretty, pretty sharp warning when he tells the Corinthians. Um, he says to them, Whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily will have to answer for the body and the blood of the Lord. A person should examine himself and so eat the body and drink the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Yeah, that's a pretty harsh thing. But I think too many of us do come to communion without reflection. Okay, that was the kind of rough part. So, you know, if you need to go to confession, go to confession. Even if you don't need to go to confession, but you're not really present, you know, because one of the things we have to do is, is be present at Mass. And I don't mean just physically present. I mean, we've got to be at Mass. You can't be worried about the booyah. You can't be worried about they're going to overcook the sausages. You know, you can't be worried about getting out on the golf course. You've got to be here, both physically and mentally. Uh, so if you can't, you know, if you're distracted or whatever, maybe you don't go to communion that day. Remember, our obligation is not to go to communion, it's to be at Mass. We should only go to communion when we're ready. But here's the, here, here I hope is the fun part. Because this is what I see a lot. I get the people who come up to communion and I get this. 
I call that dealer's choice. I get pick a hand, any hand, or give me five. I, do you play cornhole up here? Do people play cornhole up here? A little game where you throw the bean bags in. I get cornhole where I'm, you know, I'm supposed to like, what am I supposed to do? Kind of. And I don't mean to be irreverent. Well, I do a little bit maybe. But this is what I see. Uh, the one that drives me crazy, you know, because we're supposed to, whether we do it on the tongue or in our hands, we're supposed to receive Holy Communion. So the body snatchers always bother me. And then there's the sneaky body snatchers. I call them the snare. They put their hands out just as normal, and then they swoop in and grab the host at the last minute. You know, all these things happen. And then I get those people that come up, and they're like, where am I? What am I doing here? Just total confusion on their face. Are you Catholic? No? Okay, well, then, God bless you. Or, yes? I don't know what I'm supposed to do at that point. But, you know, all these things, they're about how we present ourselves, how we are disposed or not disposed to the Lord. I mean, if we're not present to the Lord, how can we say we're having communion with him? One of my favorites, this happened with the grade school. The kids would come up. I'm going to do it long ways because if I do it this way, I'm going to fall off the stairs. The kids would come up. I love saying the grade school mass. But they, and they're always very shy. And they would stop like two feet away from me. And I'm like... So I'd had it. I talked to them about it before. This was in, in my current place. So I only got to say mass for them like once a month or something. So I'm like, I'm done. And so every time they'd stop, I'd take a step forward. And then the next one would stop. And I'd take a step forward. And so I ended up about halfway back by the end of communion. And, you know, the principal doesn't know what's going on, but she knows I'm not happy. And so I, after Mass, at the end of Mass, I said those three dreaded words, those three words that nobody ever wants to hear at Mass. Do you know what they are? Please be seated. Yeah, you never want to hear those words, especially if there's a bishop in the house. If the bishop says next weekend, please be seated, break for the doors. But, you know, it's not just the people who receive on the hand that do it badly. Let me make sure I get all of these. In fact, the, the worst offender is the person who receives badly on their tongue and you end up getting licked. There's nothing worse than getting licked. Monsignor, am I right? It is, it is bad. And, you know, it used to be you could just do this. Now you have to go get out the surgical scrub and, you know... Um, there's the, the lunge. It's like, uh, like, like you're bringing a worm to a, a, a hatchling, and they, they kind of come at you, and you're like, oh, God. Then there's cornhole 2.0. They just open their mouth, but they don't stick out their tongue. And then there's the guys that I want to say, look, I'm not your ENT. I'm not your dentist. I don't need to see your tonsils. They open their mouth so wide that I think they're going to dislocate their jaw. And again, you know, I'm not saying all these people don't, aren't presenting themselves properly for communion, but, you know, we got to think about it. we got to think about what we're doing. Like, we're supposed to make a reverence before we receive communion. And sometimes the guys that do it in their hand, they wait too long, and so they kind of do this escalator thing where you're trying to hit a moving target. Or if they receive on their tongue, 
I call it, instead of the escalator, it's more the elevator, because they, they do this kind of curtsy. It's, it's, it's funny watching men kind of curtsy for the Eucharist, and, you know, I've stuck it in their forehead before, because, again, you're, you're aiming at a moving target. Again, this is all to say we should be present at Mass always, but particularly at that moment of the Mass. It's the most sacred moment of our lives. We are receiving communion with Christ and entering the life of the Holy Trinity. If anywhere we need to be fully, consciously, and actively participating, it's at that moment. So, I said, you know, if this doesn't affect our lives, it's kind of meaningless. So when you approach the altar today, if, if you approach the altar today, if you're ready to receive Holy Communion, please do it with full, conscious, active participation. You owe that much to yourself and to God. This is the way that we're transformed into the likeness of Christ is through our participation in the Eucharist. This is how we enter into the life of the Trinity. Again, if the bread and the wine is the only thing that changes and we don't change, then we're wasting our time. And I'll close with the opening words of Jesus from the Gospel. I have much more to tell you, but you cannot bear it now. So come back and join us uh, this evening. We'll be talking about the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. Monday night, we'll be talking about the Eucharist in the New Testament. And then on Tuesday, we will talk about um, the early church's notion of the, trend of, of the Eucharist. This is not something that the medieval church developed. It's not Thomas's Aquinas's hocus pocus, as we often hear. Uh, so come and join us. Uh, we will have, and you know, I taught high school for eight years, so one of my favorite parts of anything is the Q&A, and we will have time for questions, and a lot of times the questions are much more illuminating than the presentation, so please come and join us.